Hello, Donna here. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to my studio. You know, when I first started my YouTube channel, my internet was so slow that I had to upload everything in parts. So what I'm doing now and what this tutorial is, is consolidating all the parts for this class, which is the hollow carved bead into one long class. Yes, I have better internet. And so uh, it should be much easier. You won't be hunting for the next part. Where's the next part? Well, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. So uh, let's get started. We're gonna make a hollow carved bead. Hello, uh, Donna here, and today I'm going to be doing a little class on the hollow carved bead. This is what I'm going to show you how to make. Now, this is the second day I've been working on this class. Yesterday I did the whole class, and I don't even want to talk about what happened, but this is the second time. So hopefully it'll even be better. Okay, so we're going to carve, but you know, I wanted to show you what it looks like. Oh, to apply a little Genesis paint to the surface. And these are hollow, so they're very lightweight. And they're, as you can see, big. Now, um, this class is really geared toward beginners. Um, if you're an intermediate, you probably know these techniques. But if you're just starting, there are many issues and many questions that you probably have. And so perhaps a class like this can save you some time and energy. So without any more delay, let's get started. I think it's time to start. So what you need to know are the tools and materials you're going to need. So let's start with clay. You're gonna need about oh, two ounces of clay. This is Cato poly clay. These were samples of pearl clay, so I just used two of them. You're gonna need my liquid clay. To form the bath bomb, the bath bombs. These are bath bomb forms. To form the hollow bead core, you're going to need uh, something to form them over, and these are bath bombs. Forms. So you'll need two of them. You're going to need a cutter. And this is not essential. This is a time saving thing, right? You roll your clay out, you cut two discs, and this is large enough to cover this and with a little bit of excess hanging over. But it's still easier because I don't have tons of extra clay that I have to deal with and remove. All right, the usual blade, needle tool. This is an acupuncture needle. This is a very fine knitting needle that I will use to incise the basic pattern on the bead. This is a pin vise with a two millimeter bit. The millimeter size of the bit will depend largely on what you're gonna string your bead on. If you're going to string it on four millimeter bunicord, then you're going to need a four millimeter bit. You're going to need a permanent marker and make sure it's a fine point. You don't want a very thick sharpie. You're going to need a carving tool. This is a V-gouge. You're going to need some CA glue. And to finish, you need sandpaper. This is a coarse grit sanding block but I've used it so much by now. It's medium, it's fine. And this Abrinet 120 is wonderful. It takes clay down so fast. So once you make your two halves, two halves, these are the two halves together. But once you have your two halves uh, cured, you're going to want to sand the bottoms, sand the edges, and this will take that extra clay, excess clay, and smooth the, the uh, surface really, really fast. 
So assemble your tools and let's get started. So let's talk a little bit about how um, this bead is put together. First of all, there is a base bead underneath. Now this is green, but ordinarily you'd want to make it out of a scrap clay because you're not going to see it. So this is underneath the second layer that you're going to carve. Okay, so let's begin. I've got my scrap clay here. I've got my two bath bomb forms and I have a cutter that is large enough to cut a circle of clay that's large enough to cover the disc. Now, this is just a time-saving tip. Because as you've worked, no doubt you've seen that sometimes you get into a situation where you have so much extra clay, it gets very difficult to trim and do things neatly. So by starting with a piece of clay that is approximately the size that I need to cover, I minimize the amount of um, excess clay, just easier to handle, easier to trim. Now this has been rolled through setting number three of my pasta machine. And, you know, I, I wanna say that you could roll your clay through, you know, three or possibly four, but you don't want to make it too thin, not too thin, because what happens is that it's a little too easy for this base form to, um, to lose its shape. Now, I just centered it on the bath bomb and I'm just sort of easing it down around. Okay, like so, here we go. Take a blade and let's just quickly eliminate some of this stuff we know we don't want like so. And there's still too much clay there, right? Yep, still an excess of our scrap clay. Now, we could bake it now at, and then after sand it off, but you know, this is a ton of clay to sand off. So we've got to eliminate some of this excess clay. Otherwise you spend way lots of time and a lot of effort to try to get rid of the excess clay. That's just too much excess clay. All right, so you can see what I trimmed away. Now I left, you see I cut a little bit too much here. Well, you know, that's really okay because at setting number three, this clay is thick enough for me just to stretch it out and fill the gap. If the clay were thinner, I wouldn't be able to do that. But since the clay is setting number three, I can do that. All right, so I've still got excess here. And let me just see if I can run my blade around like so and eliminate some of that. Now I'll push it down again and stroke it out. And I think that looks pretty good. Now, right here, you see we've got excess. But in a case like that, there is so little excess here that I think I'm just going to cure it and then sand it later. Because that'll be simple enough to do. Okay, so there's one. Now I'll do the next one um, off camera. But let's finish this one. And of course, you know, you'll do what I've done here.
to the second half, the other half. Now we're going to cover this with another sheet of clay. And so we don't want to have any air pockets between this clay and the aluminum form. Because when you get an air pocket, you get a bulge. So let's pierce, make lots and lots of little holes in the clay. And these, these will sort of function as vents. So if there's air, underneath this clay, it should escape through the hole. If it finds the hole, it will escape through the hole because the air, as it expands, will follow the path of least resistance. And that's what we're doing is we're creating opportunities for that air to escape. All right, so let me cover the other one and then I'll be back. Okay, so here they are covered both both halves and I will cure them in my oven at 300 degrees uh, for 30 minutes and I start my oven cold so you might think maybe that's not long enough maybe that well it is long enough in my oven it takes about 10 minutes to get up to temp that gives me 20 minutes of curing time but you know remember I've got a second layer of clay going over the top so I don't really have to cure this for a long time. And it will be plenty strong enough. It will be fine to sand, it'll be fine to glue, it'll be fine to handle and to cover. So 300 degrees, 30 minutes from a cold oven. I'll be back. All right, while our pieces are curing, let's move on. Now what I have here it's one ounce of pearl, one ounce of pearl. Now this blob here, this kind of soft, squishy blob, this is one of our new products. It's actually clay softener. So we're going to use that too. Now I'm gonna do a conditioning demo because as I said, this is a beginning class and maybe you're not familiar with my clay. Maybe you don't know the best and easiest way to condition it. All right, so what I'm gonna do is stand it up on end, take my blade, cut it in half. Like so. Now, this is the hardest part. Get all the cellophane off. Do not leave any cellophane on the clay. Okay. All right. Just make sure. If you leave the cellophane on any little bits of cellophane, what will happen is, of course, it will become part of your clay and create a problem later. All right, so you can see how thick it is, half the thickness. It's just like a regular bar, two ounce bar. Or the thickness is the same as a regular two ounce bar. I don't want to confuse you. Now I'm going to take my acrylic rod and this is a very important step in conditioning clay like mine. Because this is a pre-conditioning tool. What I mean by that is I'm going to take and I'm going to flatten this clay until it's just a bit thicker than the thickest setting of the pasta machine. Now, I don't know how old this clay is. It's a couple years old, at least. It was sitting underneath the table in my, stu in my um, laundry room where I keep a lot of things. I had put it there so I wouldn't forget it was there. And then of course, for two years, I forgot it was there. So I pulled it out and I said, hmm, I wonder if this clay is really, really hard or if I'll be able to use it. And lo and behold, it's actually quite nice. It is Kato, so it's on the, th on the uh, stiffer side, but still it's wonderful. Wonderful.
Okay, so you can see. Oh, that I've just thinned all the pieces. Now I'm going to roll it through my pasta machine on the thickest setting. And why don't I, I'll just do two. Eventually I'll do all of them, but let's make it a little faster. Set my machine to the thickest setting. Roll through. Roll through. Now I could continue folding and rolling through the thickest setting, but you know what? That doesn't make any sense because it takes longer than rolling through a thinner setting. So I've reset my pasta machine, skipping one setting. So my machine starts at zero, so now I'm at two. All right, thinner. I'm gonna reset my machine again. This time I'm on setting number three. And this is where I will fold and roll and fold and roll. Let me take this one too. Put the two together. Fold. Now, the clay is not conditioned, but I can tell it, it's not a particularly soft, fluid clay. It could be softer. And, you know, it's for this project, it would be beneficial for the clay to be a bit softer. So let's use a little bit of our clay softener and work that in. Now, when you use the clay softener, it's advisable that you do what I did, which is take your base clay and sort of semi-condition it. Get the clay moving. And um, what happens is when you fold it and roll it, fold it and roll it through the pasta machine, the clay actually gets stickier, right? So what is happening is it's starting to stick to itself. So the introduction of something as soft as this, you see, is very, very soft. So it's a lot softer than the base clay. The base clay is not going to reject this very, very soft clay. And it might if I hadn't rolled it through and made the base clay just a little sticky. Okay. So let's roll this through. And I didn't fold it, so you can see it just kind of pushed it across the surface of the pearl clay. And now I will fold and roll. Okay, so it's working in nicely. You can see there are no little bits everywhere. Um, sometimes when you introduce a clay that's, or a material, even like a liquid, that is uh, such a radically different consistency, you will find that it's it sort of shears, it shears off. It doesn't want to join together. But in a case like this, and I think it's because we preconditioned the pearl before we added the softener, you can see that it's adhering to itself quite nicely. So I'm going to continue. I will um, add this to this, but I don't think you have to watch me do that. You saw what I did the first time, and then I'll be back. Okay, I'm back again. Now, I incorporated that other ounce of clay into the sheet, and um, I added a little more of the softener, because remember, 
put it in for just that one ounce. It wasn't quite enough. Now the clay has a nice soft and supple feel. And this is uh, rolled through the thickest setting of the pasta machine and it's still quite fluid. Now um, our bead has pearl underneath graphite. So the pearl layer is quite a bit thicker than the graphite. So let's cut just some of our scrap or some of this jagged edge off and let's tint it using another one of our new products. Now this, I love, I love this stuff called blackout and what it does is it takes your scrap clay and it turns black and this clay is very soft but it has a really dense load of black pigment so you can take some and mix it in and we're gonna make graphite. Now, some people have asked, can you do that with black? Well, yes, you can, only you would need a lot more than this to get the same result. So let's see what that result's gonna be. All right, so here is our graphite. Now, as I said, it would have taken about twice the amount of regular black clay to, to achieve this color. All right, now we're gonna make our, um, our wrap sheet, the carving, uh, the carving layer. And it's composed of the pearl underneath and the graphite on top. So the pearl's been rolled through the thickest setting of the pasta machine. And you know what? I think I'm going to cover this one. So what we're going to have to do is just make sure that this sheet is wide enough to go from this hole to this hole. That's the width. So I can cut it. Uh, I'll cut it about right there but at this width, we'll be able to wrap and cover this hollow form. All right, now the graphite sheet, I'm going to roll through setting number seven. So what you were listening to was uh, basically me rolling through setting one, three, four, five, six, seven. So I didn't just immediately go from one to seven. I went down a little gradually. Trim the excess. Okay, now we're going to take this sheet and we're going to roll it through setting number four. Starting once again at zero. One, two, three,
and forth. So this sheet will wrap around this form. Okay, but before we get to that, got to check on the halves in the oven and see if they're done because we got to pop those off the form. Be back. Okay, guys, um, they're cured. They're cured. Okay, so now it's time to take them off of the form. That's really easy. I hope it's easy. I'm going to take a blade and just... The other one was easy. <laughs> Arg. Gotta get you in there. Maybe, oops, maybe I'll try this one. Hmm. That's pretty funny. Well, I felt it. I felt it move. Okay, there you go. This one was, trust me, easier for some reason. Well, whatever. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're actually going to put a hole, our bead hole. So locate the center like so, like so. And then I'm going to take a little hand drill. This is a two millimeter bit find that's an extremely useful size. And of course, if you're going to be stringing something through here that's considerably uh, of a considerably larger diameter, then you would get the appropriate bit size. Okay, that's easy enough and it makes a very nice, nice hole. Okay, let's examine this edge. You can see see the excess clay here? It was over the rolled edge. Well, of course, we have to get rid of it. So we're going to take this. This is our Abra net. It's 120 grit. Lay it flat on, uh, on your work surface. And just push it down flat to knock off those bits of clay that we need to get rid of. And that's pretty fast because the opera net is pretty rough. It's not a fine, a, a fine grit material. It's very coarse. All right, let's do the other one. And there you go. Now they should fit pretty nicely together. All right, so let me knock the dust off and we're going to glue them together with some Loctite. It's a CA glue. So just apply some to one side. Da, da, da. Okay. Put the two halves together. Got stuck on the other. Oh. 
sometimes it happens. Okay, that's pretty good. Now I'm just going to press the two halves together for just a moment to make sure that they are stuck together. Okay, there we go. Now I would, I'm going to set this aside and let it sit for a while. So um, we make sure that the glue is really, that these two halves are really uh, glued together and they won't come apart. So I'm setting that aside. Now it's time. Excuse me, my nose is stuck up. To actually cover a hollow form. And this was the one that I made before. It's just a hollow form. I would have used scrap clay, but I used green, but it's it's really okay. Now, you can see that when I put the forms together, they don't always match perfectly. And that's quite a sharp edge there. And it just, it, it could be so much nicer when I actually go to put this sheet of clay over it. So, of course, I'm going to sand it, and I have sanded this edge with a coarse grit sanding block. Now, I've used this sanding block a lot, so by now it's probably a medium grit sanding block. But just sand it to smooth everything out so you have no sharp edges. Okay, so we're ready. Now I'm going to take liquid clay, just going to put it on my work surface, and with my fingers I'm just going to take and I'm going to coat the hollow form. Oops, sorry. This is Genesis paint. I did not cut myself. Okay, I have a nice coat of liquid clay on it. It's nice and sticky. Let's take our sheet. Let's start with a nice clean edge. And first, we're going to center the sheet on, let's call this the equator. Okay, making sure that this clay sheet is wide enough to cover hole to hole. And it is. That's where it ends. Okay. Now we have to um, bring, of course, we have to cover the ends, right? The area at the ends, uh, the area around the holes. We have way too much clay. So I'm going to take and slide this over, just pull it right over. And now with my blade, I will cut and I'm aiming at the hole. I may hit it, I may not, but that's where I'm aiming at. And I did, I got it. Okay, good. Now I'm going to take my thumb 
and just press the sheet to the form about one quarter. You see, if you can imagine, let's say this is north and this is south. So I'm going to push this clay down to what I think is the east point. Then lift, pull it over. And then sort of following, I can see where the clay is underneath. So I will try my best to cut along that edge and remove it. Now, if you cut away a little too much, it's really not a problem because you just kind of slide it over and fill the gap. But what you really don't want is you don't want too much clay. You don't want to um, be in a position where you haven't cut enough away, right? Now, here I'm going to take my thumb. So now we're at the what I would call the south point right here. So I'll go from the south point and cut up to the hole. Once again, take and pull the clay over. Cut the excess away. Remove it. Close the gap, and then one more time. And now what? I will make two cuts. One cut here, remove the excess, and then let's take that one last cut. and then push the seams together, like so. So I'll just show you right now what that looks like. All right, it's nice and tidy. And I got very soft, so I'll try to speak up. But when you're doing this, just take your time. You're going to repeat on the other side. All right, and I'm not going to do it because you saw the process once. But here's a caution for you. I was not very careful about the way I handled the clay on that side. So it's pretty soft and it's kind of sticking to itself a little more than I would like. So I will have to make sure that I don't have any of this clay that's like overlapping on itself. Okay. Now let us take this nice long knitting needle, go through the hole and find the opposite hole. So we don't lose the hole in the bead. Okay. So I'm going to cover the other side and smooth it. So you can't see the seams. So I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. And um, 
As you can see, I've covered it up and it's looking pretty good. Now, remember when we pierced those little tiny holes? When we covered these? Well, we're gonna do the same thing. Now, maybe if you were making a bead that was very smooth and you were going to see everything about the surface, you wouldn't want to pierce these tiny little holes. But because we're going to be carving, nobody's going to see them. So we're going to give any potential air bubbles underneath this sheet of clay the opportunity to leave without expanding and making a big bubble. Okay, now I just wanted to comment about something else. Um, if you've used my clay before, then you know that, you know, the, one of its positive attributes, let me start that again, that one, uh, that it, it doesn't blend as well to itself as uh, we would like. And, you know, no clay is perfect. Every clay has its particular characteristics. But what I've found is by adding the blackout that turned this graphite or the clay softener, it changes the blendability of the clay. So here is the graphite. And you can see that it's quite a bit easier to stroke and smooth the clay to itself. Okay, so that's, so if you're sculpting um, and, or doing something where you've got a lot of blending clay pieces to each other uh, going on, then you might wanna just add a little bit of the clay softener or the blackout. Okay, so here we go. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to map out some very, the, the basics of this pattern. This is a simple pattern. You can see there are just eight lines that run from one bead hole to the other, and they're equally spaced around the equator. And then I've carved at an angle one way and then another way. So you get this sort of gentle zigzag running around the bead. And that's what we're going to do today. It's just a simple pattern. If you don't carve or you if you haven't carved very much, then I would suggest that you do very simple patterns or non-patterns. This is another example. These are just very short cuts. And um, this is the perfect thing to do if you're a new carver because you really can't make a mistake. Okay. All right. from one hole, I'm just going to lightly incise a line. Then I'm going to start at the equator and aim for the hole again. So that's one, not too deep. Try not to, try not to press too deeply in. Now let's go directly across. once again so it's hole to hole so now i've done one whole line around the bead and i'm sorry my, my voice is dropping off i'm getting a little plugged up i mean it must be spring it must be the beginning of spring when i spend all my time sniffing sniffling Blowing my nose. Okay. Ta-da! Ta-ta-ta. Now let's divide the ones I've already done.
and after it's cured, I will have um, these base lines to carve first and then fill in the rest. Carve out the rest, excuse me. All right, so let's get this in the oven. Now this time, I'm going to bake it for 40 minutes, 40 minutes. I'm starting at 300 degrees. It's a cold oven again for 40 minutes. Hello, back again. This is uh, actually day three. Uh, day one was a disaster. I did all this work and then I deleted it all. And uh, day two, I discovered a new editing program. So I'm hoping that this works a little better. I did upload one part through a learning experience. All these programs don't interface with YouTube the same way. So, so always learning something. So here is our cured hollow bead ready to be carved. Now I took a sample carving right here because I wanted to see how deeply I had to cut to expose the pearl underneath. And I don't have to carve terribly deeply so that tells me that when I sand the surface, you can see I sanded the surface here lightly, uh, I will just sand it lightly. If I had to carve very deeply in, then I could sand a lot more. But uh, no, this time, just a light sanding with my coarse grit block. Now what this does is it creates a surface that grabs the tip of the carving tool a little better than the surface, the slick surface straight out of the oven. So it's just a little bit of tooth that I'm going to bring up by sanding. I was watching the videos last night. I realized something. I say, okay, a lot. So uh, that's my next challenge. Not to say, okay, at the beginning of every single part of a class. Forgive me if I forget. Okay. So here is the bead ready, and I think you can see how it's roughed up a bit. Let's talk about carving tools. This is a V gouge, and I am going to take some clay because you know, these tools are very small. That's small. I mean, sometimes you can't hardly tell whether it's a V or a U. So the way you can make sure you have the right tool is just to take a piece of clay and take the tip and press it in. And you can see that's a very sharp V. Excuse me, it's spring. My allergies are kicking in. Okay, so I did this around one hole. Let me do it again. Or let me do it around the other. Now, if you haven't carved before, uh, practice on something that's flat, just to get the feel of the way the tool enters the clay and the proper angle that you're going to send the tip or the cutting edge through the clay, because that's kind of the goal. You want to find the perfect angle at which you're sending through the clay so that you get the depth you want and so that the tool doesn't constantly leave the surface of the clay. You see, if you hold the, um, I'll do it on the side. If you hold your tool too flat, like, oops, let me look, too flat this way, of course the, the tool is going to keep coming out of the clay. If, if it's too upright, oops, too upright, then it won't carve at all. So somewhere between these two points, you will find the perfect angle at which to hold your tool and to push it through the clay. And when you find the correct angle, you're going to find that it's quite easy to carve. 
Now, the only other rule is that you never point it directly at yourself. Now, I realized when I was carving around the hole, sometimes that's a little difficult. You have to be, um, you have to be a little more careful. But most of all, you have to be aware at all times of where this is pointed, whether it's pointed at you. And uh, if you notice that, then you want to correct it. All right, so here is one of our lines. I think you can still see them, they're faint, but I didn't want to make them too deep because if they're too deep, then I have to dig too deeply to get to the bottom of this incised line that I made. I just want to see it. I don't want to really feel it. I don't want it to push too deeply into the clay. So with your tool, position myself in the best place so you can see and start and and this isn't a, a race so you can take your time if you find that you haven't carved quite deeply enough in a, a spot then you can always carve again you can just go over the original uh, carving. These are just for reference. Now you'll notice I'm, I have a pretty good grip on the bead with my left hand. With my right hand, I'm using my pinky to brace against the surface. And as I get to the end, I'm actually um, sort of lifting the blade, the uh, tool up a bit to leave and then exiting the clay. Now, when you carve, carving also tells you something else. You see this, this string, this little piece carved, it, it came off quite nicely in one piece. And if you carve and you see a lot of little chips, it's just chip, 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 chipping when you carve, that means your clay is not properly or adequately cured. There is an exception. I believe uh, Sculpey always chips, even when it's cured. Okay, so let's do one more. Enter. find the proper angle. You know, you can feel the blade as it's, as it's cutting through the clay. Another thing I noticed is the addition of the softener, the clay softener. And I did add clay softener to, to, um, to the pearl, uh, has made it a bit easier to carve as well. That clay softener actually serves to soften Cato poly clay. And as it softens the raw clay, it also apparently softens the cured, which I guess makes sense. That's a little shallow there. I will just go over it like so. Any place it's shallow. And this is kind of a nice pattern. I, I don't expect it to be perfect. I don't expect every single cut to be uniform. I don't expect the spacing between them to be absolutely perfect and uniform again. But what I noticed about this one that I did on day one, the failed day of class, is that if the angle here from the equator up onto one of these baselines, these reference lines, excuse me, is shallow. As you carve, it the line sort of straightens out. You, you can see it goes up and down, up and down, but it's not very extreme. It sort of flattens it out. So I think this bead, I'm going to try to make um, this angle more extreme, okay? So I'm not gonna carve the rest of them because you saw me carve two, but I will carve the rest of them. But just imagine 
that I have. Next thing you're going to do is find a point on the equator along one of these reference lines and draw from one to its adjacent neighbor. like so. And I hope you can see that. The pen is not really wanting to... Um, I can see it, but I suspect you can't. Okay, then I will find a point on the equator and from this, from the high point on this one, I'm going to take and I'm going to draw to the point. And I will go around the entire bead and it will look like do, 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 like so. Okay? Now, once all of that is done, I will carve from the equator to the high point from the high point down. Equator, high point, high point down. All the way around. Now, you know what? This this is getting uh, a little long, longer than I like. So I'm going to stop. Um, I will carve this one piece, this V, but then I will be back after I've carved the whole thing. Or after I've carved. Okay. I'll be back after I've carved all of these reference lines, and I've marked all of that. Okay, later. Here we are again. This time I didn't say okay. Um, and what I've done is what I said I would do. I carved the reference lines, the eight lines, and then I drew in pen the zigzag reference lines, we can call them that. And then on this side, I actually carved them. So let me carve this other side. Now, if you draw, and, and you want to use a, a pen like this, it's a fine point permanent marker, and um, you'll want to draw the lines, and if you make a mistake or you don't like it, just sand them off. We're going to sand it at the very end to get any remaining pen marks off anyway, but your sanding block will act as your eraser if you make a mistake. this closer to me. I'm having a bit of a problem. I'm reaching out and carving. All right. Now, um, what I'm going to do is carve to the center 
and then um, carve from this angled ref reference line to the equator and then carve following the same angle all the way up to the hole. Now I'm going to take my pen and I am actually going to draw where the cuts inside of these triangles will actually end. because without that line, it would be quite easy to overshoot the mark. I can even carve them out. Let me do that. I didn't do that last time, but I think that it will actually look really good. Okay, now I know I cannot overshoot when I'm carving these lines. Okay, so you can see kind of as a goal, I carve these and then in the next uh, triangle opposite, the same number of, um, of cuts or the same number of rows. And so let's do the same thing going this way and then going that way. So I'm going to start where I ended the last one on the other side and carve to the equator it again. Now, I, I don't know that this is critical. I, I don't think anybody's going to grab your bead and say, oh my gosh, you messed up here. Because it's not one of those kinds of patterns where anybody would expect absolute perfection. So a lot of what we do actually does deal with that expectation. If people look at something and everything's perfect, they will detect imperfections because the eye seems to be seeking, seeking them. But a pattern like this where the lines are not perfectly uniformly of the same depth or spacing kind of a, a more folk art rustic kind of thing. Like the difference between fancy French pastry and rustic French bread, I guess. Okay, so now I would go around and carve all of them uh, the same way, so all the triangles in the middle and then start carving to the equator in each of the sections. Now, I don't think I have to do more because it's a repetition, it's just the same thing 
carving up. So I'm going to cut and uh, I will carve and then I'll be back. Well, I carved around the equator, all of these, and I decided to change the pattern. So the pattern, I want to show you now, I could describe it to you, but it's easier to see. So what I did was I went from the high point here, the apex of these center um, pieces, and uh, I just went higher up on the next baseline. Then I came down, went up. What I'm going to do now is follow this angle down. I think this is more interesting. The other pattern was kind of boring. So I think this will be better. Now I'm going to follow this angle and carve two our original one of our original lines. So that's what it looks like from the equator. Now the next line, the next uh, section in one of these will go from this top line to the baseline. Okay, so here's the top line. Now I'm going to carve to one of the original eight lines, like so. Okay. Now, if it's helpful, you might want to just take your pen because it's, it is easy to get confused. So to avoid confusion, take and draw a couple of lines in the direction you'll go. Like so. And then this is going this way. because once you carve them, you can't take it back. It's one of the things about carving. Once it's there, it's there. All right, so let me finish up and I will be back. And here is the carved bead. I carved it out completely. Let's compare it to the other one. Aside from the difference in size, I think the larger one is kind of boring. So just by changing the direction of the cuts, um, I created a, a different pattern. And I like it better. I like it much better. All right, so I'm going to finish it off by lightly sanding with a sanding block to remove any pen marks. 
And once that's done, rinse it in water, maybe just a little diluted soap. Dry it off, and we are ready to go. Okay, so. I hope you've enjoyed this class. I'll be putting up more short freebie classes um, on my web on my uh, YouTube channel. I've decided that this year I'm going to work a little harder at it. And um, so I hope you come back and I hope you enjoy. And if you have any questions, just put them in comments and I will try to get back to you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.